What's going on, party people? It's your boy BQ. Welcome back to the Negative BQ YouTube channel. This is your mailbag for November 2024. Typically, I open these questions up on the Impact Lounge engagement group on Facebook. I didn't really come around, so I opened up the mailbag on Twitter. I got a couple bites, but they're just not questions I'm comfortable asking asking and answering at the moment because they're I, I got to dig deep a little bit. So I'm going to push those off. But I did open it up on Twitter. Um, I love giving my opinions on stuff that you guys want to know my opinions about. And um, the thing is, no, I do not work for TNA. That's what the TNA marks are very quick to remind people. That I am just a fan. I am just a podcaster. And you know what? They are correct. But I do have some connections. And when I answer questions and I'm giving my opinions, I'm able to factor in some of the information that I, I may know that I haven't directly said, you know, so when you ask me these questions, yes, I'm being a fan I'm being a podcaster in, in answering them, but there are things that I, I know and things in the back of my head that I'm able to bring to light a little bit based on what your questions are. So we're going to jump into this one time for your mind. Kruger Child asked, do you think TNA is better post Scott? And do you think he was the one hindering them all this time? I mentioned this on my recent Impact review that, and I've said it several times before, I jumped on TNA just like everybody else did when the Scott news came out. I had no information. I even bothered to get the information. I had a knee-jerk reaction just like everybody else did. And I thought it was a huge mistake. You know, Scott was still kind of the face of the company. And now that, I mean, the company's face, it's faceless now. The, you know, as far as the, I, I can't remember these guys' names, the dude's in charge. Um, they, I, don't, I, I would not know what they look like if I passed them on the street. Like, it, 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 it's faceless. The company is faceless at the moment. And I thought that was a bad thing. But I'm kind of learning that it's not. And then I've, I've learned since Scott was released that, you know, that it, it was Jeff, Jeff, um, legitimate job performance. The company was very, very stagnant under him. And I, I mean, I think he wanted the company to grow. I don't think he knew how to get there. I don't think he had a vision that, um, that led to results. I think he had a, a vision that led to a company staying where it was. You know what I mean? Like, he got him to a certain point. Don't get me wrong. He was charged with a, or he was faced with an impossible task, was to resurrect TNA, or resurrect Impact Wrestling. One of the reasons I respect Scott is because he was brought on with Don Callis once upon a time to steer the ship. I think Don Callis thought they were going to get Kenny Omega and Chris Jericho, because AEW didn't exist at this time. And I think that was his big plan. And when he didn't get them, he said, I want to go to AEW to work with them. And that's exactly what happened. That's the first thing he did on screen. I mean, he left a executive role to go be a manager on TV. So I think a lot of fans on the TNA side lost a lot of respect for him for that. But he left Scott to, to do this by himself. I say by himself. He had, he had a team. He has a team. There's lower management. There's... There's other personnel. That's not what I mean. But as far as being like the face of change, he was, Scott was by himself at this point. Now, if you're comparing the Anthem era when Don Callis was around to when Scott was running things by himself, I don't think Don Callis had any creative ideas. I think Eli Drake, a.k.a. Uh, L.A. Knight, even said this at one point that he was a do-nothing. That he was going around hitting on the girls, but actually did not do any work. <laughs> he said that on his, uh, he had a podcast for a little bit when he was with the NWA. I do think Scott was the one doing the majority of the work behind the scenes. I will say when Don Callis was around, I think he had a better eye for talent. I think some of the people that he brought on are uh, more recognizable names. And I don't mean recognizable like, uh, they came from WWE, but I mean, I think he was responsible for Tessa Blanchard, for 
uh, Joe Hendry initially. He brought in some people that stood out, in my opinion. When Scott was by himself, he was bringing in the Boo Pinders, the Sheldon Jeans, which I think Sheldon Jeans is actually pretty talented. But he he was just bringing in people that just did not have a high ceiling. And it's not necessarily the wrestler's fault, but I mean, I guess what I'm saying is he was bringing in guys that with no vision and no plan, and they were just kind of like stuck in the mid card for a really long time, and just nothing, nothing really uh, became of them. So I think Don Callis had a better vision of bringing in people that translated to TV a little bit better and stood out from others. I think Scott brought in people where he's like, this person's talented. I don't really know what to do with them, but they're talented, so let's see what happens. That, that's kind of where I, I, I saw things. Now, under Scott, I, I think from about 2020, you know, the pandemic time to 2022, I thought Impact Wrestling was putting on some of the worst television they have done in the history of the show. You can you can or you can go back to the the Hogan Bischoff days, um, and then the 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 worst time in TNA history is the Global Force Wrestling period. That when Jeff Jarrett came back, and I know that's for a short amount of time. That was the worst television they've ever done. But I I I think um, the 2000 to 2022 was like a very close second or a close third. It was to the point I was going to quit podcasting. I was I was legitimately. I've told this story before. I I wrote the long tweet. You know, I I created a long um, blurb on a notepad, and I was ready to tweet it out that I I just cannot cover this company anymore. In the beginning, when I started my podcasting, I was a very positive voice for the company, and over time, I've become, you know, old and and uh, and bitter and. <laughs> <laughs> whatever and i'm i'm much more of a critic now that i was once upon a time but the, that period of the the pandemic to 2020 i shouldn't say 22 um I, yeah i will say to 22 and then part of 2023 2023 started getting a little bit better to me but at least for a period of two years i thought it was the worst show i was not happy watching it i was sick of we own the night i was sick of the show being drowned in red I was sick of D'Lo and Stryker on commentary. Um, I was sick of how the show, the show looked and sounded. And I know we're supposed to give everyone a pass because of the pandemic. I thought they put on the worst wrestling pandemic show. And they were coming out and saying, we put on the best pandemic wrestling show. Like They, were, they fully, in their head, believed that they did. And I, I didn't think so. Like what AEW was doing during the pandemic was, I, I think, actually the best television they've ever put on, period. <laughs> Oddly enough, they were blown what TNA was doing out of the water. I was watching some Ring of Honor. What they were doing in the, you, you know, I thought was good. WWE obviously was just in a different stratosphere, the way they were approaching approaching things. And then I'm watching other show, other, other things, you know, I'm I'm watching the WNBA. I'm watching Major League Baseball. Everyone had their own approach to the pandemic, except TNA. TNA was wrestling in an empty arena, and that was it. Like that, there was no creative spin on it whatsoever. And then they're going, "We put on the best pandemic wrestling show." Like this was legitimately pissing me off. And and I was telling myself, this company doesn't want to grow. They have no desire to grow. That's how I felt under Scott. The, for a lot of the time under Scott, I was like, this company doesn't want to grow. They're very content with mediocrity and they think that they're better than they are. Just like Tony Khan right now thinks AW is a lot better than it is. That's, that's very dangerous. That is very, very dangerous to never feel like I have room to grow. I have an improve. I have room to improve. Tony Khan said, we have the best women's division. We have the best wrestlers in the world. We have the best creative. We have the best, this and this, the best commentary. To him, nothing needs improvement. So I think that's very dangerous thinking. That's how I took things under Scott Demore. And then I'm watching um, Maple Leaf Pro. I'm watching the second night right now. It's As I've said, it's a really hard watch for me. It doesn't mean I think it's bad. It's just a hard watch. 
I'm seeing Scott's ver- vision of TNA. That that is what I'm seeing when I'm watching this, and I'm not excited. Again, I don't think it's bad. And if it was a weekly show that was an hour long, I'd probably watch it. But when I'm watching Forge and Excellence, I'm seeing Scott's vision of TNA in front of me. And um, again, it just does not get me excited. So I think, you know, long story short, I'm giving a very long answer here. I think the company right now, 2024, is the best television they have done in years. I can't even compare it to an, another time. This is the best television they've done maybe since I've covered the show. I have fond memories of Pop TV. I thought they had a lot of really good episodes there. They had some bad episodes there. But I think they're doing the best work right now they've done in a long time. The company is clearly in a better place without Scott Demore there. You see it visually, number one. You hear it number two you see there's people in the crowd number three they are creatively right now struggling they are out of ideas creatively but that is the area where i'm giving them a longer leash because um that was that was that was a spot where with scott departing was not a smooth transition okay who's going to be in charge of creative so I know that there is some butting heads behind the scenes, and that's why, and we see it on screen because we see things that don't make a whole lot of sense. But I, I think they're slowly doing better, and I think 2025 is going to be just a killer year for them. I think starting off with Genesis was one of the smartest things they could have done. I think you got to get rid of Hard to Kill, which was the Don Callis, Scott Demore idea. I think it was more Don, but you you got to get rid of that. Genesis is perfect to bring that pay-per-view back. And I think it's going to have a lot of buzz behind it. It was, it was appropriate to kill hard to kill to, uh, to pull the plug, but yeah. Um, you know, long story short, I do think that Scott held the, the company back a lot. Scott's baby facing himself, by the way, this Maple Leaf pro, you know, running the TNA ads and trying to, he, he's baby facing himself. Like he's, I'm, fairly certain he's bitter towards the company he's just not publicly going to look like that he's not going to allow that because that's gonna that's gonna hurt him so you know in the beginning i just thought this was a terrible mistake and every podcast in the world said it was but now i'm um now i'm learning they did the right thing and we're seeing a lot of positive changes on tv and um I think 2025, I, I think we're just going to have a real big year, a really fun year. They always kind of reset the roster a little bit. I think they're going to get rid of those last few people that Scott was holding on to that he had under contract that just don't have it. You know, he, he we gave the old college try. They just don't have it. Um, and I, I just think we're going to, I think we're in store for a really, really great year. Gazeltoff asks, um, will us UK fans ever get a pay-per-view? That's probably something I need to ask, but I think that day is coming. I do. There was, there was, um, they were teasing it for Bound for Glory, right? What I was told about Bound for Glory, because do you remember they put out a press release? We're going to give the, the location and date of Bound for Glory. Um, it's one of the most traveled to cities in the world. Remember, remember all that stuff they put out? And then the date came and there was no announcement. And the uh, press releases were removed. And you know what I mean? So what I was told, I don't know anything specifically about the UK. But what I was told was that with Scott's departure and with other departures within the company, There were things that were in place and changes. There were just with the departures and with the people let go, there were just changes that happened because of that. You had certain people talking to certain venues and talking to certain people, and now those people are out of the picture. And now you're kind of starting from scratch. 
So I think that was in the works. I think that was something they were looking at. And then all of a sudden we, we pivot to Detroit, which is not one of the most visited cities in the world. I have no issues with the Northeast and the Midwest and everything. Like, trust me, I live in Las Vegas. I would, I would kill to be back in Illinois. I loved living there. I, I moved here because my wife wanted to move here. I have no problem with that, with that part of the world or the part of the United States. Trust me. I, I don't care about cold weather. None of that shit. I actually really wanted to go to Bound for Glory. I just decided it was an unnecessary expense at this time in my life uh, with the holidays coming up and all that stuff. I, I just decided it was unnecessary. Um, so we'll see what happens next year. But I actually did want to travel and go there. But um, that's why we got such a, you know, it, we waited so long on the Bound for, Bound for Glory announcement was because you're, you're removing people from the company whether they were fired, let go, they walked away on their own, whatever. And now relationships that you had with, that they had with people, those relationships are gone. And now you're putting new people in place and now you got to book new venues, you know? So I think I, I, I wouldn't be shocked if it didn't happen in 2025. If Bound for Glory was not from there in 2025, I wouldn't be shocked. But I think one way or another, TNA will be back in the UK next year. Frequency AO, he says, or he asks, your thoughts on TNA going live January 23rd? And then he's got a second question. Who's been the most improved TNA talent in your eyes? Can be interviewer, announcer, too. If you know me, I'm not going to say interviewer or announcer. You already know that. Um, my thoughts on TNA going live. I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about it. W you know, what I was told with their relationship with NXT was that NXT has been Personnel at NXT have been showing personnel at TNA how to produce good live television and how to produce live television, period. So there's when there's a relationship between these two companies, it's not just, hey, we're exchanging wrestlers. You know what I mean? There's there's more to it than that. So yeah, I was told that they're, you know, they were teaching them how to produce television, produce produce live television. Also, Anthem is, you know, obviously. In, in the removal of Scott and some of these other dudes, they were bringing in people who know how to produce television. So I think this is something that has been in the works for the majority of 2024, like preparing to kick off 2025 with a live episode. Every once in a while, they would do like a live episode on Pop TV. There was a little bit of a delay, like 30 minutes or something like that. Those episodes typically did pretty good viewership wise. And they typically had some kind of like, I, I think they did um, the Destination X live where, where Moose debuted. They did the debut on Pop TV live where James Storm returned. So in, in this live episode, we sh I'm not a big like surprise person. That doesn't steer me either way, whether I enjoy a show or a pay-per-view. But I do think if you're going to go live, there has to be some kind of surprise for the people, uh, like a legitimate surprise. I think you have to do that. Uh, so I'm very excited about it. I think they're going to they're going to put all the all the cards on the table and and put on one of the best episodes we've ever seen because it's going to set the tone for 2025. When they were rebranding to TNA, I said. This is their last opportunity to establish themselves as the alternative to WWE. And that can be very difficult with a taped TV show. If you're live, that's a different story. But I will say that the way the company has improved and grown, there are people now looking at TNA as the alternative because AEW is so bad right now. You, you see the diminishing numbers in viewership and um, live attendance. You can... Dave Meltzer can spin that shit all he wants. The show is bad. I stopped watching it because it was bad. And I just said earlier during the pandemic, I thought they put on the best pandemic wrestling show. And I thought it was the best period of, of AEW flat out. I, I thought it was the best wrestling company at the time. Wasn't my favorite, but I thought they were putting on the best shows. And it got so bad over time that I just couldn't watch it anymore. I think there are people who now look at TNA as the alternative. 
especially because WWE has, is now letting their fans know, hey, it's okay to watch TNA. Because before, when we refused to acknowledge them, refused to acknowledge the history of Samoa Joe and AJ Styles and these guys, why, if they if they're telling their fans this company's not shit, we're not even going to pretend they exist. Why are the fans going to even give it a chance? But WWE NXT has now given them permission <laughs> to watch TNA, and that's really helped the company a great deal. So, um. I would not be surprised if we didn't get someone from NXT show up as well. Um, maybe even from the main roster of WWE. If there's any time to do it, it, it's there. But this live episode is is part of the reset. I shouldn't say the reset, but it's just part of kicking off 2025 the right way. I think it's going to be the best episode of the year. Hopefully, it's Hopefully, it's something they're going to look at going forward. I have asked this question before and I kind of got hit with the no comment. So I think they are looking at trying to go live, but it's expensive to go live and they will lose a lot of money if they do it every week. If they even do it once a month, they're going to lose money. So hopefully they have a plan um, to make it happen, but I'm very excited for it. I think everyone should watch the episode as it airs. I'm going to watch it as it airs. I did not watch impact as it airs. I've probably in the last three years watched it twice while it's on, while it's airing. So this time I will watch it and I will probably react immediately after the episode. I will probably do a podcast right after that. Um, so I'm very excited. But who's been most improved TNA talent? It's been Alicia Edwards to me. And I'm not just saying that because I've obviously been very obsessed with her for years. I talked about this on the last podcast as well. When you go from this character who everyone is just constantly saying, oh my God, she cannot talk. She's a horrible promo. She's a bad actress. She can't wrestle. I mean, there's all these things were said about her for a very long time. And now she's become the mouthpiece for the system and she gets heat and she gets a reaction from the people. And she's a better worker now because she's working as a heel and she's working a little bit smarter. And she's she's in feuds now that means something. Because when she was just babyface Alicia before, you know, she's there for four or five years, not a part of a single storyline, not a part of a single feud. I say not a single fo- storyline, unless she was playing Eddie Edwards' wife, which I know she's his wife, but you understand what I'm saying. Unless she needed to be the damsel in distress or something, she was not in a storyline. So in that sense, she was just basically like a jobber in the company. So what is she going to do? How is she going to prove what she can do in the ring? She's just... They just needed to use her when they needed someone to lose a match. So it's very easy to say, well, this person can't wrestle or whatever. You start putting her in matches that mean something. The, the matches have got, gone over a lot better with the people. But she has played a role in helping getting Masha Slamovich back over again. I think she's going to play in role, a role in getting Tasha Steeles back over again. And she's you remove her from the system, the system is OVE. Because I said for the longest time, when OVE was around, like, they need a girl, they need a girl, they need a girl. Bring in Nevea, bring in Nevea. And then they got so fucking stale because they just wouldn't add that element to the group. So, yeah, to me, she's just the most improved talent um, on many, many levels. I don't think there's a close second place, honestly. Because if you look at, um, you can take just about anyone from the roster and say, what were they doing in January of this year, and what are they doing now? And who's doing something significantly different? To me, me, it's Alicia. You know? We haven't been having the conversations about how stale Eddie Edwards is all year. Because that's always been a conversation. It would take way too long to switch his gimmick up, and then he just became white meat, or just boring, or whatever. We don't do that now because he doesn't, Eddie doesn't have to cut promos as long now, thank God. But she is, um, she has really helped the system. She's really helped Eddie. She's really helped the TV show. So I just, I don't think there's a, there's a close second place. I, I, you can't say Joe Hendry because Joe Hendry did not get to where he is based on TNA's booking and TNA's creative. It was completely unrelated. But I, I, I can't look at a, a single person they brought in. You know, Ash by Elegance, minimal um, change 
from the beginning. Zaya Brookside, who I'm really, really high on. I mean, she's the same person they brought in. Um, Mike Santana is the same per you know, he's doing great work, but he's the same person they brought in. You know, like there's there's no like real improvement in someone. There's no growth in a character. We just, you know, Mike Bailey probably has gone backwards, if anything. Um I'm trying to think if anyone else pops in the head. Like it, it's definitely Alicia. What do we got next here? Jamil, 5150, do you think TNA needs an actual mid-card championship instead of wasting an X-Division title reign on someone who won't benefit the division? So I would imagine he's talking about Moose here. I actually disagree with that statement that he won't benefit the division. Now, do I think he is going to have good matches with, you know, they're just going to put him defending the title against guys like Laredo Kid and all that shit? No, I, I don't think that's going to happen. But where he's going to help the X Division is that because he is Moose, because he is part of the system, if someone challenges him for the X Division championship, there is going to be a story involved. We get very few stories in the X Division, and I actually think he will ben he will boost it as a mid card title. I've always said the X Division is a lightweight cruiserweight division. And I hate when they try to church it up as something different than it is. But if you're going to put the title on Moose, then you've got to go in all in on that. You've got to go all in on it's not, it's not a cruiserweight division. It is your mid card championship. And this, if, so if that's what they want to do, Moose is the person to do that with. But you know he hasn't really been on screen the last couple of weeks because again, like he's not just going to go go out and wrestle. Bupinder Guzier, and they're going to have an X Division match. And the majority of the X Division, I think, is heel, heels right now. Like, if you're talking about Allen Angels and you brought in Jay Christ, and I can't think of all the X Division guys on the top of my head, but I don't feel like there's a lot of baby faces. We have Leon Slater, who Leon Slater is more of a, hey, I'll win the X Division title in Ultimate X type of dude. I don't see him in a storyline with Moose. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's going to be difficult to find him an opponent. I think they're going to actually have to bring in people from um, other companies, you know, the, the AEW, WWE retreads to feud with Moose in the X Division. I think that's what they're going to have to do for a little bit. But um, the positive is that wrestling Moose, who's the X Division championship, you will be involved in a major storyline. So I think. In that sense, it's going to really benefit the X Division. But it also highlights the fact that we need a mid-card title. And, I, I mean, I, I have destroyed the Digital Media Championship. Like, that is, that is a step below the turkey suit fucking challenge or whatever the hell they call it. The title means nothing. PCO is doing nothing for that belt. The problem is everyone who's in a program with PCO doesn't benefit from it. They just have um, a storyline feud with PCO. It goes to Monsters Ball. PCO wins Monsters Ball. And then the person that he beat is irrelevant after that. AJ Francis is a great example of that. When have we seen Big Con on TV ever since uh, he had this freaking... I don't even want to call it best of three series with PCO because he never beat PCO. They just kept wrestling. And PCO kept winning. You get involved in a feud with PCO, you go nowhere after that. And you put the fucking title on him. So it's kind of like they clearly have no idea what to do with him. I don't think he's defending at a turning point. They're saying the champion's supposed to wrestle every month and defend every 30 days. There's They got nothing for him. So I thought that was just like the dumbest thing you could have done was put the title on him. But that title is a, a straight up prop. I I don't even think the wrestlers take it home with them. You know what I'm saying? So yes, they need a mid card title. But you have to decide: is the T, is the X division your mid card title, or is it a freaking cruiserweight championship that when 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 it's convenient, you say it's not about weight limits; it's no limits. I think there has to be a clearer vision for the X Division Championship because I don't see it as a mid card title. I still see it as a low a lower card title. 
for small wrestlers. So Moose being the champion might be their, them taking that step forward to it being a, a mid-card title. And they're going to stop with the stupid weight limit, no limit nonsense. They're, it's just going to be a straight up mid-card title. That's what I think where, where they need to go with it. Make a decision either way. But I, I think the the easiest thing, I've said this a hundred times, they dropped the ball so hard on this. The easiest thing was top of 2024, rebrand a TNA, get rid of the digital media championship, rebrand as a television championship, boom, we're in business. To me, that's that was just the easy, the easiest thing. Every day that passes, the digital media championship has less to do with digital media or social media. It is one of the worst ideas they've ever had. The Grand Championship had more of a vision of a cha- uh, of what they were going to do with that belt than this does. And we look back, we don't look back fondly on the on the Grand Championship. A lot of people think this is a it was a fucking prop. I remember EC3 when he was holding it. He was telling fans this title means nothing. This is a prop. But at least they had some sort of fucking vision for it. Like this is a joke what they're doing. So we'll see in 2025 what they do. What do we got next? This is the last question from the little shorty. Of the rumored people to be leaving TNA, who do you think has the best chances of staying? When um, when do you think... Oh, there's a lot of questions here. When do you think Joe Hendry will win the TNA world title? Because they can only tease putting the belt on him for so long before we get tired of it. Do you see any TNA stars, male or female, as an entrant in the Royal Rumble? 2025. So as far as the rumored people leaving, who are the rumors? Jordan Grace, which people destroyed me on my own channel saying, you don't have a crystal ball. I'm so sick of you saying Jordan Grace is going to leave. You don't know she's going to leave. She's leaving, right? And I said that with 100% conviction. So she's gone. We're not even going to call her a rumor anymore. The other rumors are Josh Alexander, Joe Hendry, Jonathan Gresham, and I'm not even going to really factor Jonathan Gresham into this because he's not really relevant on the TV show. So if you're looking at Josh Alexander and you're looking at Joe Hendry, I think Josh Alexander is going to stick around. I think he just really, really wants to test free agency. And if I'm going with my gut instinct here, I think he wants to test free agency because he wants to receive offers from other company, other companies and then go back to TNA and say, hey, NXT offered me this. AEW offered me this. Because if he goes to another, if he goes to one of those shows, he will not be featured like he is in TNA. So I think he's okay with being in TNA, but I think he's like, yo, pay me. Fuck you, pay me. You know? And I I think that's fine. TNA, I think, is willing to pay the people at the top. It's just the people at the bottom that aren't making anything, but the people at the top, I think they're willing to pay. So I think Josh just wants TNA to come at him with a competitive offer. And it's difficult to do that if you're not fielding offers offers from other teams. Because, uh, I'm sorry, I'm thinking of sports. If you're not fielding offers from other companies, because who are you competing against? You know, I, I see it all the time in the NBA. Someone will get this huge contract and it's kind of like, who were they bidding against? You know, it'll be some of these players that are like towards the end of their career. And had no other options. And then they just get this like contract that just seemed too large uh, for what they bring to the table. Uh, Right now with Josh Alexander, TNA is not bidding against, wasn't bidding against anyone. I think Josh wants to, to go to the table and say, hey, I'm getting these offers from these other places. I think he knows this is the place for him. I don't even think Joe Hendry is a foregone conclusion that he would go to NXT um, I would say it's 50-50 at this point. But I don't think he's going to be like Jordan Grace where like get me out of my contract quicker so I can go there. I think he's going to stick around for a while. He knows he can do both shows. I don't think there's there's a question about that. So I still think if, if TNA is willing to make him the face of the company, I don't think he should be. But if he is, I, I don't see why they wouldn't pay him I mean, when you're when there's rumors that you were going to pay Will Ospreay seven figures, 
I mean, come on. You've got the money to pay some of your guys at the top. So I think if they want to keep those guys, they probably can. So we'll see. But I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that either of those two leave. Jordan was 100%. As, as soon as I was teased. Because what people don't understand, Jordan, before she signed her last TNA contract, said, I, wa- I, I want to wrestle in NXT. I think TNA just made her a great offer, and she took it. But she has publicly said years ago that she wanted to go there. She, you know, putting the work that she puts in and the work work she puts in on her body, what she does in the ring, like you can only be in a small company for so long. So all you people were getting in my in my comments telling me I didn't know what I was talking about. Obviously, I did. When do I think he's going to win? Joe Hendry's going to win the world title. It'll that'll be a genesis. You know, they were able to sell a lot of tickets, a lot of pay per views for Joe Hendry's big bound for glory match right um the company knew to to capitalize on that and he puts here they can only tease putting the belt on for so long before we get tired of it they won't have to put the belt now for me he's not my champion (laughs) i don't care if he's the champion or not i don't even want him to be the world champion if i'm being honest with you but you have to do it at genesis you have to because if you drag that out any longer, it's dead. I, I promise you, it's dead. I think they know that too. I think all the fans know that they're, I mean, they're, the story on TV is that he's going to start from the bottom, right? No one else is even teasing wrestling for the world title. He is the only person, and they're keeping him involved with Nick Nemeth. He's going to wrestle him again. I was saying on the podcast too, that every time that TNA has a storyline of I'm going to start from the bottom and I'm going to do this and this, it means I'm going to wrestle a couple jobbers and then get to be the number one contender again. And that's what's going to happen with Joe Hendry. He's going to wrestle in the turkey suit, then he's going to wrestle a jobber, and then he's going to be a world a number one contender shortly after that. And then he's going to win a world title. So it's going to happen at Genesis. I think that's the, the worst kept secret in the world. Um, and then do I think do I see any TNA stars, male or females, that entering in the Royal Rumble? Joe Hendry will be in the Royal Rumble. I'm I'm very confident in that. There's there's not you, you see when they bring when WWE says, Hey, we're gonna feature a TNA talent on our pay per view, it's Jordan Grace, it's Mickey James. Like it's only been women so far. You don't have you don't have those girls on the roster anymore come the Royal Rumble. And they're going to want it to be a surprise, too. So it's not like they're going to do Jordan Grace back-to-back years. It's going to be, uh, they're going to make sure it's a surprise. They're going to make sure it's somebody people know. I know that the marks be like, oh, I I hope it's Moose. and It'll be Joe Hendry. It's going to be him. His music is going to hit. Everyone knows the song. Um, And business is going to go for Joe Hendry big time after that. So um, that's... That's the only person I see. I, I don't see anybody else. I don't think they're going to bring multiple TNA people on their show. I think it's going to be Joe Hendry, and that is it. Speaking of that is it, that'll do it for me for today for my mailbag episode. I am your boy, BQ. We will talk again soon. Peace. <laughs>